We are a faculty of 61 people. Uh, we have currently 180 undergraduates uh, pursuing their physics majors and we have 134 graduate students. We basically are pursuing research at all scales, so the scales from the subatomic, uh, so particle physics type scales, all the way up through cosmology, so studying the largest scales, the scale of the universe. We have theoretical and experimental programs in atomic, molecular, and optical physics, astronomy and astrophysics, biophysics, condensed matter physics, high energy, both particle and nuclear physics, physics education research. The Burke Nanotechnology Center is the central facility on the Purdue campus for faculty and students who are interested in working with things that are small on a nano scale, 10 to the minus 9 meters. My research is interested in looking at how electrons behave when they're put in either reduced dimensions or put together in such a way that they're their behavior is dominated by their strong mutual interactions. And in order to do that, we have to create certain crystals that confine the electrons to two dimensions. And we do so by putting it in a thin layer of a semiconductor called gallium arsenide and surrounding it by a different semiconductor called aluminum gallium arsenide. Now, what's unique about this is because of the technique of molecular beam epitaxy, we can make those layers nanometers thick. And when you make something nanometers thick, you actually quantize the energy levels of the electrons. The Burke facility is unique in that it, it was designed from the ground up to have the infrastructure to do just this type of work. So when you look at this refrigerator, this is a very special instrument that's able to cool the electrons to very, very close to zero absolute temperature, which means a very low value. And in fact, we are the leaders in achieving these low temperatures. This allowed us to really discover new kind of electronic states. We discovered for the first time a couple of fractional quantum hole states here at Purdue. And we can also study other states which would develop, but we can push them into a, a very special regime where they would be very weak. We study what electrons do inside of solids, and we look at novel materials. A lot of these novel materials uh, have the, the electrons interact so strongly that you can't use traditional theoretical techniques anymore. One of the things that's observed at the surface of some of these novel materials is that the electrons interact so strongly that they start to clump up and form patterns. Our group is the one that discovered that sometimes those patterns are fractal in nature and one of the things that that can help reveal for you is whether the patterns are driven just on the surface or whether they happen in the bulk of the material. Some of our most significant findings of the past couple of years have been that the kind of train track electronic patterns observed at the surface of some cuprate superconductors using, say, scanning tunneling microscopy, those patterns aren't just growing merely on the surface, but they actually originate from deep inside the material. That means that that could be the framework on which the superconductivity arises in those materials. You're in the dark matters lab at Purdue University where we try to build detectors to catch dark matter particles. So we know that the universe is full of dark matter, but we don't know what it's made out of. And here we try to find out. So our idea is to take essentially a bucket, we fill it up with liquid xenon, and uh, we watch it very, very carefully and see whether there is anything happening. Xenon has the very nice property that whenever it's being hit by a particle, it gives off a flash of light. And so we built the most sensitive devices around that bucket of liquid xenon to try to find even the tiniest signals within it. To find those dark matter particles, we need to work in big collaborations. And so the collaboration that we are a member of is the xenon one ton collaboration. Here at Purdue, we are working on two key aspects of that. Uh, whole endeavor. One is the calibration of the experiment. How do we really understand how the detector reacts to known particles so we can look for unknown particles? The other aspect is how can we use that detector to extract as much information out of it as possible, in particular in search for unconventional new kinds of signals. What we're doing here is working with some fantastic students and a really excellent team on what I think is some of the most exciting analysis you can do with those experiments. Living matter, unlike conventional matter or dead matter, is exciting in many different ways. Uh, 
Living matter is typically highly variable. We know that no two cells are really the same. So one of the challenges of studying biological systems is that unlike almost all of textbook physics, they are highly probabilistic systems. How do you perform experiments on exciting living matter such that you get reproducible high quality data? And also, how do you develop theoretical techniques so as to address the probabilistic nature of living matter? We have found that cells growing and dividing under extremely different conditions are really doing very similar things. What this means is that there's a unit of time, a biological unit of time inside the cell that the cell knows how to calibrate for different growth conditions. And if you look at it from that point of view, different conditions are not really different, they're really all the same. The research in my group focuses on using simple physical models to try and understand how collective behaviors emerge in populations of cells. So cell signaling is like the machinery that cells use to respond to changes in their environment on a fast time scale. So there are lots of different proteins in cells and these proteins can be modified in various ways like changing shape or binding together or having chemical groups added to them. And the ways in which they interact form a big complex network that is sort of like the brain of a cell. We know that cells communicate with each other in various different ways, and so we want to understand at a very fundamental mechanistic level that communication, such that when we start to explore larger and larger groups of cells, we can see new and interesting and different behaviors emerge. We have a very vital and uh, active group in the department uh, that are looking for young students to join their research efforts. We have excellent facilities. Uh, we have good support. Uh, if you want to answer basic questions about physics and astronomy, this is the place to come.